Ah, I didn't see you there. I was just drinking this air because I didn't feel like spending money on wine. Hmm. Newark. Nowadays, it seems like wine is incredibly expensive, no matter where it's produced, whether that be France or South Africa. But back in the day, connoisseurs of wine always preferred French wine. It was seen as far more prestigious and was viewed as better in quality simply by virtue of being French. However, in 1976, a seemingly small and low-key wine tasting put all of that to a screeching halt. And I promise you it's an interesting story, even if you don't like wine. Trust me, I'm not a big wine fan, I don't have the bankroll or the palate for it. It's known as the Judgment of Paris, and it changed the face of the wine industry forever. French wine has always been held in particularly high regard by wine connoisseurs, alongside Italian and Spanish wines, even German wines to some extent, even though you might not think of Germany as a wine-producing nation. These are called Old World Wines. These are areas where wine was traditionally produced. Outside of that, there are then New World Wines, which is everywhere else. Now, it might be a little bit Eurocentric in its concept, but this is a major way of how wines are classified. New World Wines tend to be more alcoholic and less acidic in old world wines, the inverse. At least that's what they told me on the internet. Until recently, old world wines were the focus of most wine connoisseurs. New world wines just didn't get any attention. Something like 90% of all wine produced in the United States comes from California, but it wasn't until the judgment of Paris that it got any real play. It got its first major start in the mid 1800s and it had a brief renaissance in the early 1900s after an invasive species from the U.S. ravaged European vineyards. But California wasn't really seen as prestigious for wine production. The prohibition almost totally killed off the American wine industry. And in California, it wasn't until the 1960s that they really started to get back up on their feet and recover from the damage. But still, it wasn't prestigious even then. Some of this is just due to ignorance and habit. People really did see French wine as more prestigious and having more value simply by virtue of being French. It wasn't like Georgia was getting a lot of attention from wine lovers, despite the fact that it was always a traditional wine producing country. Some of it was also obviously down to French people just being French. After all, how could stupid Americans make a good wine? It was also just a different product as well. Even if you made wine with the same techniques, same barrels, so on and so forth, you'd end up with a different product. The temperature was different, the soil was different, the rainfall was different. There's so many variables that go into the production of wine. It's actually rather incredible. Even the fluctuation of temperature from year to year can have an actual effect on the taste of wine. And one year, a batch from the same vineyard can have a rather different taste from one in a different year, just based off of temperature alone. Despite people not really paying attention to them back then, supposedly Californian wines were quite good. Californian winemakers continued to try and promote their wines through traditional means, but no one was biting. It's a happy coincidence that in 1976, the US was having its bicentennial, and the British wine importer and connoisseur, Stephen Spurrier, decided to have a small wine tasting at his wine school in Paris, L'Académie du Vin, on May 24, 1976. Patricia Gallagher, who was managing the school for Spurrier, was a proponent of Californian wines and had been impressed on a trip to Napa Valley the previous year. For that reason, and the bicentennial, a tasting comparing French and American wines, Californian, was decided upon mostly to act as marketing for his school and shop. Spurrier selected quality Chardonnays, this is white wine, from both California and France, and for the Reds, French Bordeaux and Californian Cabernet Sauvignon. As the story goes, Spurrier actually selected wines that were good, but not good enough in his mind to beat the French wines. His intent wasn't to make a fool of the French, and his shop sold almost exclusively French wines. These California wineries were small boutique operations that had only been open for a few years at most. The French operations, on the other hand, were the giants of wine, beloved for generations and regarded as premier cru and grand cru marking them as a class above all other wines. Spurrier invited top French wine connoisseurs and journalists from across the country to really spice up the event. Thankfully, all accepted his invitation 
and the tasting was changed to a blind tasting from a regular one because he figured that the French would quickly decide to give the Californian wines bad scores just by virtue of not being French. Also among those in attendance was Time Magazine's George M. Tabor, who later wrote a book about the event. Also, Spurrier's wife Bella, who took photos. In truth, it was a rather small affair, and out of all the reporters they asked to attend, both French and English speaking, only Tabor showed up. No one thought that it would even become a story, given that the French wines seemed poised to win just out of the gate. But instead of being a non-event, the judgment of Paris turned out to be one of the biggest events in wine in quite a long time. The tasting took place at the nondescript Intercontinental Hotel in Paris at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They had three hours before they had to leave. The venue after that was going to be used for a wedding starting at 6. There were nine French judges presented with a series of wines, first white and then red, and they were asked to rate each wine out of 20. Now some sources say that they had to choose based on four categories, color, nose, mouth, and balance. Others simply state that they could choose general scores that didn't have particular categories. They determined the tasting order of the wines by picking them out of a hat. Then they started with the white wines. The judges were stressed out and started to talk amongst themselves. A rarity for blind tastings, I'm told. They didn't have to identify the wines, mind you, just rate them. The judges were all over the map, declaring that certain wines were Californian because they didn't have a nose, something which I assume has to do with the overall smell of the wine. In reality, oftentimes they were confusing the Californian wines with the French wines and the French wines with the Californian wines. Spurrier called for a break after the judges finished the whites and began to tally the scores. Given how much time it took for them to judge the Chardonnays, Spurrier decided to announce the results then rather than at the end of the event. The American Chateau Montalena walked away in first and Chalon Vineyard came in a close third. All of the judges had rated at least one American Chardonnay higher than any French. Now obviously these results really freaked out the judges. They wanted the French wines to win very badly, but they didn't have the ability to recognize them. And they simply went off of taste or misconception, leading the Americans to snag a victory. It seems that the Californian wines masked themselves quite well. Part of this was because at the time, I'm told, the Californian winemakers used French wines as a benchmark. So in a sense, in 1976, the Californian winemakers were making better French wine than the French. When they moved on to red wines, things were a little bit different. The judges were more aware of the producers and which wine was which. As a result, the results were a little bit tighter, but all the same. The Californian Stag's Leap wine cellars came out on top. In response, some of the judges were complimentary towards the Californian wines. Some were sad that France lost, and others were enraged. Odette Kahn, editor of La Revue de Vin de France, immediately demanded her scroll cards back. Others declared that Spurrier had fudged the results in favor of the Americans. In the end, none of the judges left happy, and some, even as late as 2005, have refused to speak on the event. Via the original Time article by Tabor, the news started to spread and the French went into damage control mode. All sorts of accusations were levied at Spurrier and the tasting. Some people claimed that the distance between Burgundy and Paris could have caused something to happen to the French wines, which is funny when you remember that the Californian wines came from California. There were also accusations that Spurrier somehow rigged the competition, which once again, really bizarre choice for him to make given that he almost exclusively sold French wines. There's also been much made about his method of calculating the scores, simply using the mean of all the judges' scores rather than something statistically fancy. But the French press largely tried to ignore the event and then eventually attempted to dismiss it as a non-event. Le Figaro and Le Monde both published articles describing the results as laughable and unimportant. This tasting was redone several times over the years. In 1978, it tests which of the Reds aged the best in 1986 and a 30th anniversary in 2006. Each time, the American wines came out ahead, in fact, even improving on their scores. Regardless of what some people wanted, wine lovers started to pay attention to Californian wines. In 2004, a similar tasting occurred in Berlin, which helped boost the reputation of Chilean wines. Now, wine is a lot more open to geographic location, and French wine is not prized just for being French, which is a good thing. 
Today, obviously, the French really don't care much about the tasting. Wine lovers will love wine no matter where it's from. But at the time, I think the French were really, really angry about it. Just recently, one of the winners of the competition had a bottle sell for $12,000, which I can't tell if that's a high price or a low price for a bottle of wine that old. Regardless, the wine industry was changed, probably forever. If you liked the video, please subscribe and press the bell icon. Also, consider pressing the like button or leaving a comment if you have something you wish to add. My next video will be returning to the Ukrainian history series. I just thought that this would be a nice interlude because I, and probably you too, are starting to get a little bit Ukrained out. It's a little bit too much of an interesting story, perhaps. Also, this is a bathrobe. It's not a, it's not a smoking jacket or anything like fancy like that. No wine, no smoking jacket or anything fancy like that. No, I don't even have a wine glass, so maybe not the... <laughs> yeah, maybe I need to increase the budget for these videos, or maybe not. Anyway, check out this video. It's pretty good. Thank you. Ah, the French champagne.